Hello everyone, we're going to be going over color picking. So we're going to be learning how to pick colors for characters and for backgrounds and all that fun jazz. So color wheels are ways that we organize our color based on hue. Hue is technically the word that we want to use. Hue and color get interchanged a lot or interchangeable sometimes, but hue is more so like our values are like how light and dark something is. Our saturation is how bright or dull something is. And the hue is the actual color of it. So different shades of green, those are different hues of green. That's technically how you'd say it. Right, so we have RYB, which is red, yellow, blue. RGB, which is red, green, and blue, and CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and key. Key is like, it's a different kind of black. RYB, we will be using RYB today just because it's considered the beginner's color wheel. It technically is not 100% correct, but it is like an old and traditional way of thinking about it, right? Don't tell your teachers. <laughs> so RGB is our most accurate color wheel, which means that red, green, and blue are our primary colors, right? So RGB is the closest to the visible spectrum that we gotten and then cmyk is a printer's colors right so if you go to print something right that's what you use cmyk tends to be a little more dull but it does have wider range of hues compared to ryb So color palettes and schemes are arrangements of color to have different effects and moods, right? When you have a color palette, they usually give off different moods. They usually give off different feelings. You usually use them in different situations. So our palettes and schemes are just putting names to those moods and how you can use them. Let's start off with analogous. This is the one that most people like to use. Analogous color schemes are three or more colors that are directly next to each other on the color wheel. So if I go from red all the way down to blue down here, that's an analogous color scheme, right? I could go in the opposite direction. If I went from red orange down to yellow, that's also analogous, right? It's just colors that are directly next to each other on the color wheel. This is a palette that you can't mess up. It's a very, very open-ended palette, but at the same time, it can get very, very boring. So monochromatic schemes are one hue made lighter and darker, right? It's considered a mature and simplistic palette and it's also easy to work with but a good grasp on values is needed if you're not very good with your values you will not be able to do monochromatic very well and that's because with monochromatic color schemes right you don't have color to rely on to distinguish forms you just have your values and your saturation so complementary palettes colors directly across from one another on the color wheel the thing is that with RGB, it's yellow and blue that are directly across from each other, but on RYB, it's yellow and purple. It's two colors that are directly across from each other on the color wheel, right? So with RYB, red and green are complementary, purple and yellow are complementary, orange and blue are complementary. You could also be working with tertiaries. So if you had yellow green, which is directly across from red purple, right? That's also considered complementary. So the traditional way of working with it is what one color is dark and desaturated, the other is bright and saturated. So complementary colors can be a bit trickier to work with because sometimes you just might not get a good looking color combination and then it'll end up looking like a Christmas tree or it just looks ugly, All right? Sometimes it just looks like a graphic design is my passion kind of poster, which is like not what you want, obviously. So split complementaries create a Y on the color wheel. So when I say Y, it starts on one color and then branches off in two different ways, like that, right? So if I start with the primary of red, then I'll end up at blue, green, and yellow, green. It's like a more thorough complementary. Like complementaries can be very, very tricky to use. Usually you need a good idea of balance and how to use it. And then one last one, which is triadic. So triadic colors will create an equilateral triangle on the color wheel. So when you create an equilateral triangle on the color wheel, right? So if we start at one primary, then we'll touch the other primaries as well. So if we start at red, then I'll also be picking yellow and blue. On the contrary, if I were to pick green, then I would also pick orange and purple. So that also creates an equilateral triangle. So just as long as you have all those colors equidistant to one another, then you have a triad color scheme. Triad color schemes you see a lot within children's products. Children's products, children's games, or like children's toys, Lego. Even look at the logo, right? The colors that you see most often, they're usually very bright and triadic. And that's because triad color schemes are just the brightest. They have, they're very, very lively. And triadics are very difficult to work with. It's, it's one that can be pretty tricky to work with if you're not very familiar with color. So triadic is usually not one that people start with. But once you get a hang of the color and whatnot, triadic becomes a favorite of a lot of people let's talk about color moods because this is how you actually pick your colors there is no concrete rule set for color moods unfortunately right can i teach you about them absolutely but e even then you're gonna have to take what i say with a grain of salt because there are strategies to work with color in order to create certain moods but those rules are often broken so let's talk about hsv which is hue saturation value 
So let's start with value. A lot of the times when people add lighter colors, nice pastels, light fluffy colors, right? Those tend to be a lot softer. They're a little bit easier on the eyes, but your darkness, darker colors add a richness. They add a bit more of a mysterious value. They give it a bit more of a, a sharper look, I guess. But you need your lightness and your darkness with your values in order to create a balanced looking piece. You should have a mix of both your lightness and darkness in order to have balance and clarity. Saturation. It's easy to say bright equals positive and dull equals negative. That's a very common one, but not necessarily true. A lot of eye strain pieces are very, very negative. They tend to be a bit darker in terms of their subject matter, but they're still incredibly bright, which means that it adds a sense of franticness to it. Panic is still a very high energy emotion. It's not a positive emotion, but it's high energy. It adds a sense of franticness. Dullness adds more calming effects. It feels more calming. It feels like a lower energy, kind of if you stare at what you're looking at. So a lot of desaturated stuff. The energy could be positive. It could be negative. A very calming, relaxing piece could be used with a lot of light, dull blues. That blue gives it a nice calming feeling, depending on the value added to it. Or it could be a negative thing, right? Maybe you could use those blues for sadness. Maybe you could use it for melancholy. All that fun jazz. But it depends on how you mix the two of them. And then last but not least, you have your hue. The mood that your hues will depict will depend on the two previous. They will depend on saturation and value. How bright or dull and how light and dark that color is will determine the mood. You can use red. Red is a color that everyone's like, oh, it's the color of love or anger or passion. Technically the truth, but you can use it in a lot of different ways. A very bright, somewhat high saturation, high value kind of red, right? It becomes a little bit more pink. In that case, it could be more childish, but it could be more panic inducing, depending on how you choose to use it, depending on the context. Everything here can be thrown out the window with the right context. At the end of the day, it's the context that you're using the colors in that will matter the most with your colors. So without the context, your colors don't matter. You need that context in there in order to portray those moods. The same thing goes with backgrounds though. If I have a forest, I'm probably not going to be using a lot of this side of the color wheel because these colors are not what you think of when you think of a forest. You think more on this side of the color wheel. Your oranges, which can be turned into browns, your yellows, your greens, right? Those feel a little bit more foresty. Maybe a bit of blue if you want some water in there. But even then you probably won't see a lot of purple and red because that doesn't really make sense in the case of a more reality, more grounded kind of looking forest. So all moods, all colors rely on context in order to work. I'm gonna be creating a composition that gives off the mood of fear. Not necessarily to scare you, but to show a character who is scared. To kind of give off the idea of what a more scared scheme might be with. A lot of horror loves their monochromatic palettes. They love monochromatic stuff or complementary. Complementary is usually used with a lot of space horror, cosmic horror. On the contrary, a lot more classic horror, even slasher, they really like monochromes. Older slasher uses complementary quite a bit. Actually triadic sometimes as well, though not often, but more often than not, you'll see a lot of monochromes within dull monochromes within your horror. If you'd like to support the channel in the creation of free arts education, become a member on Patreon. So I want to kind of capture the feeling of late night paranoia which usually makes you feel like you're really small in a really empty room. Doom in itself, doom as a feeling, there's two types of ways that you can portray doom, right? There's the frantic, somewhat intense emotion of like impending doom, and then there's the slow kind of realization of doom, right? The slow kind of realization, I would stick with more, with less saturated colors. I'd probably stick with very low, low colors overall right because that kind of gives you that slow sense of sadness compared to the frantic like oh my god the world is ending i've got to run around everywhere real quick that one i'd use very bright frantic colors for still kind of dark but a little more frantic i think much brighter depends on the subject matter of how the doom is occurring blues and purples whenever i envision um blue, purple, and black. That's very cosmic to me. Very, very cosmic. So that's always how I think of it. When I think of doom, it's like I think of impending doom, I would use some blues, but I also might go for some dull yellows and greens. In that case, it'd feel more like the same feeling that um, I don't want to set the world on fire by the ink spots gives you. I think that's a good a good comparison or a good enough comparison that I can give you. It's like I could go for the blue 
which is more realistic, but I feel like it doesn't have the same energy to it. Maybe I need to change the color. Oops. Because I want something warmer. So I'm like... Maybe I'll shift to that up. And then use a blue overtone. Sticking with kind of desaturation here. Where it feels like the, the walls are kind of caving in. I feel like I need to lower the values of these two. See, if I add a shine to it, like I could, but then it might end up making it look a bit strange. That's not bad, actually. And then let's do it. There you go. That gives it a bit of the, the wet look when you zoom out. Gives it more of a marbly look. Yeah. I was thinking about adding tears. I feel like tears are a little bit much. I wanna keep it fairly minimal. If we add the tears, then it's kind of like, then the panic happens, right? Then we have a bit more of that panicky kind of feeling. I want the kind of calm before the storm somewhat. Tears start to come when you start to feel that intense panic start to build up. I want, I want that feeling before the panic sets in. If you liked what you saw, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you never miss an upload. Join our art community with the links down below if you'd like to support the channel and the creation of free arts education. Become a member on Patreon for working files, behind the scenes posts, and discounts on our class offerings. If you enjoyed this video, here's a couple other videos you can check out next.